Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. But first, for these last couple of episodes of 2022, I wanted to ask a favor of you. If you would sub show your support for the show by making a donation to the Skeptic Society. This podcast is primarily supported by uh, the 501c3 nonprofit organization that I co-founded with Pat Lindsay 30 years ago. You can see her over my shoulder there. Uh, who sadly passed away last year. We've since been doing a kind of restructuring here, moving our offices, redesigning the magazine and so forth. And uh, the podcast has really taken off. Uh, it is free and I want to keep it free, open to everybody uh, to listen to on all the different platforms. Same thing with my Substack skeptic column. Uh, it's free for everybody, but um, people are making um, uh, subscriptions, pay, paid subscriptions, five bucks a month, $50 a year, uh, various different levels. And uh, that really, all that money goes into the Skeptic Society, not my personal account. And um, and then this show, of course, we do have one uh, advertiser, Wondrium, and then occasionally Ren. Uh, both great companies, but the podcast is primarily supported by you, by uh, by people that make donations to the Skeptic Society. And since we are a 501c3, you can deduct it from your taxes. So I'm asking you now, between now and uh, December 31st, 2022, uh, that you uh, show your support. Anybody who donates 100 bucks or more gets a signed copy of my book, Science Friction, Where the Known Meets the Unknown. This is an older volume collection of my articles and essays. Um, and we had some cases left over after our move that I found in storage. And uh, this is so this is a first edition hardback signed uh, for anyone who gives a hundred bucks or more. And uh, of course, the again, the hundred bucks is deductible after your, your taxes. And uh, so that uh, really appreciate your support there. The magazine, by the way, is redesigned, as I show oftentimes on this show. Uh, for 2022, we've taken on uh, four color inside. As you know, you've probably seen this before. New paper, slick, glossy, nice, beautiful paper. Uh, and beautiful designs and um, covers and topics, most importantly. Not just the normal debunking the paranormal and the supernatural and pseudoscience and so on, which we do uh, regularly as part of our uh, wheelhouse mission of promoting science and rationality and so forth, but also taking on controversial subjects like race and abortion and trans the fourth issue that comes out next week is on nationalism. And then next year, we're getting into uh, some more to uh, topical topics like money and economic matters, energy matters like fracking and renewables and nuclear power and electric vehicles and peak oil. Education matters. That is, to what extent do we need to reform the educational system? You know, Why are we falling so far behind other um, industrial democracies around the world? And then the last one is going to be on health matters, keto diet, statins, the opioid crisis, antidepressants, mental health issues, and so on. So as you can see, your support um, continues pushing us forward in new directions. And if you believe in science and reason and rationality and critical thinking, and empiricism as the bulwark against fake news, alternative facts, pseudoscience, pseudo history, and all the kind of quackery that's out there, then... Uh, then go to skeptic.com slash donate and make your donation there. That's again, skeptic.com slash donate. If you want to read the details of the fundraiser, you can go to skeptic.com slash fundraiser and you can read uh, my letter, personal letter there. Uh, or you can just mail us a check if you're old school and uh, we still are old school too. We accept checks. You can mail it to our new address, 3938 State Street. Suite 101, Santa Barbara, California, 93105. That's where I'm sitting now in our new office. That's 3938 State Street, Suite 101, Santa Barbara, 93105. All right, thanks for listening. Wondrium is the sponsor of this episode. Wondrium is the former Great Courses teaching company, now expanded to a full subscription service. If you subscribe to Wondrium, through the podcast, you get two years for the cost of one. Two years for the price of one. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash 
you know. S-H-E-R-M-E-R. -E -E That's right. Here's an example of a course that I have not taken yet. It's the Middle Ages Around the World. 24 30-minute lectures. Medieval beginnings, the fall of the empires, including the Roman Empire, obviously. Constantinople, the rise of Islam and Europe's knights. Reading in Islamic culture, the medieval spread of religions. Ooh, I'm definitely going to listen to that one today. Uh, medieval growth and prosperity. Yes, they actually had an economy. <laughs> How about that? Medieval towns and trade networks. Just visiting some of those in my recent trip to Germany. I like to visit old medieval towns and their walled castles with moats around them. <laughs> Very interesting. Ooh, cathedrals. Sacred architecture of cathedrals. Yes, I just went to the dome in uh, Cologne, Germany. Phenomenal. Deeply moving. Uh, they really knew what they were doing in the Middle Ages to create a sense of awe and wonder in a particular architectural location. Anyway, m uh, life in the medieval palace, high Middle Ages in the Americas. We had high Middle Ages? Yeah, people lived here. All right. Anyway, check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Schirmer. Get your two years for the price of one subscription. Take that course along with the other courses that I recommend. It's well worth it. All right, here's our episode. My guest today is Megan Dom, the author of six books, most recently, The Problem with Everything, <laughs> My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. Her collection of original essays, The Unspeakable and Other Subjects of Discussion, won the 2015 Penn Center USA Award for Creative Nonfiction. She was a Los Angeles Time opinion columnist from 2005 to 2016, and I always get the print edition, so I remember those well. And Megan has written for numerous magazines, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and Vogue. She's a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts grant, and has taught Columbia University in addition to teaching private workshops in personal essay, memoir, and opinion writing. She is the host of the weekly interview podcast, The Unspeakable, and the co-host with Sarah Hader of the weekly podcast, A Special Place in Hell. <laughs> I really like that title. This year, Megan founded the Unspeakeasy, an intellectual community for free-thinking women. Hi, Megan. Nice to see you. Hi, Michael. Good to see you. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So we're going to get right into the um, uh, in into what you do best, which is write about a lot of your personal story uh, in the context of the culture wars. So just give us a little bit of a what I call an unauthorized autobiography. Who are you? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, I've been around for a long time. I started publishing in the the mid '90s or so, so I uh, I sort of stumbled on the personal essay form when I was uh, in grad school at Columbia. I went to the MFA writing program, and I thought I was going to be a, a fiction writer because I think like a lot of people back then, I thought that if you were a writer, you were like either a newspaper reporter or a novelist or something like that. And um, I I knew I didn't want to be a newspaper reporter because I didn't want to like knock on people's doors and annoy them and that sort of thing. Um, so I thought I would just be a, be a fiction writer. And then I went to uh, grad school and I studied with people like Jane Howard, who was a legendary uh, magazine writer. She wrote for Life magazine in the 60s and 70s. And she's like the kind of writer that would write a big, high concept nonfiction book and go on the Johnny Carson show, you know, and talk about it like really old school. So, um, and I started reading a lot of the new journalists from, you know, the 1970s, Joan Didion and Tom Wolfe and, um, people like that. And I realized that you could write, uh, personal essays where the, the personal element was really a lens through which to look at the culture, to look at bigger ideas. So I kind of found my way into that form. And I was fortunate because I was able to start publishing pretty early on early in my in my mid 20s. I had um, a couple of pieces in The New York Times and then I was in The New Yorker. And that was like the best thing that ever happened to me sort of thing. And I kind of found my way and I was a freelancer for a long time. And it was the sort of the last part of the the golden age of magazines I, in the 90s. I wrote for all the magazines and I traveled and had columns and that sort of thing and um, published a couple books and was an LA Times columnist for about 11 years. And uh, here we are now in the, in the Substack age and the podcast mm. age and uh, mm -hmm. much, much has changed. 
Yeah, indeed. It's uh, the whole media landscape has changed in our lifetime so much. You know, you mentioned the Carson show. I mean, that was huge. There weren't many options. And if you got on there, that's, I mean, at one point, I think it was like 30 million people watched. Right. You know, and none of the talk shows have anything remotely like that now. Right. So, um, yeah, what do you do? So you must get this a lot because I get it. Uh, you know, how do I become a writer? What do I do? I want to break in. I want to do what you're doing. How do I get an op-ed in the New York Times? How do I get a book contract? Where do I find an agent? You know, I teach writing, I've taught at Columbia, and I teach private workshops now in uh, personal essay memoir, and now op-ed. Increasingly, uh, I teach op-ed because that's actually one of the few ways to get published now. I've kind of had a crisis of conscience about this, Michael. I mean, I'm curious what you think about this in terms of advising people, because it's I can't tell them to do what I did because that just doesn't exist anymore. The model is not there. Um, so... You know, I guess, well, one thing I will say that I did, I mean, on principle, just the very essence of what it means to be a person who expresses his thought in the world, you have to say something that feels urgent to you. You have to think of the thing that you really want to say that you feel like a lot of people are thinking, but maybe afraid to say or don't know how to articulate it and say it in the most surprising, sort of delightful, original, unapologetic way possible and just write the hell out of that idea and then try to find a way to get it out there. Um, and that's easier said than done, but that is definitely what I did in the beginning. And I think that still applies and will always apply. Yeah. I call that Darwin's dictum. Uh, all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any service. Mm -hmm. He wrote this in a letter, private letter after in 1861, and, you know, 1859, The Origin of Species was published. Uh, there was a big conference at the British Association of Advancement of Science in, uh, in 61, early 61. He couldn't go. He usually didn't uh, do many public events. And so one of his friends wrote and they said, well, uh, they said you were too theoretical and you, you advanced your ideas too strongly. You should just let the facts speak for themselves. And he basically said, you might as, if you're a geologist, you might as well just count up all the pebbles and record the colors how odd it is that anyone should not see that all observation must be for or against some view if they are to be of any service, <laughs> right? You should have an opinion. I mean, you know, just put it right out there. Um, and, you know, very most, actually most books do that. Most papers do that. Uh, and just people are not as honest about the fact that I think, you know, they're, they really are voicing an opinion. They really do have a side that they're taking and what they're writing about. And I don't know, I think readers would appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting what you're saying. Yeah. So even in the guise of uh, objectivity, nobody's really, truly objective. Right. Yeah. The way I like to think of it in terms of writing an essay, I mean, I always think that an essay is a suggestion. It's not, it's a little bit different than a column. I mean, when I was an op-ed columnist, I was definitely writing little essays every week. Um, I'm not a polemicist, so I've never, I'm not really interested in saying like, this is the way it has to be. And, you know, you, I'm not, I'm not debating anybody on the page. But I do think of the essay and of my nonfiction sort of more generally as an invitation for the reader to think alongside me as I sort through my thoughts. And for me, that's the most satisfying kind of journey to be on as a writer and to offer the reader. And it's a, it was a little bit weird when I was an opinion columnist, because I think people were like, well, what is she really saying? And you know, what is she what side is she really on? But you know, at the, to, to, to think is to be conflicted, right? I don't, I think if to be absolutely certain um, is a little bit of a liability. I mean, I actually just had a guest on my podcast, The Unspeakable, talking about this last week. You know, there's a, there's a difference between feeling confident in your ideas and absolutely certain of something. Uh, so, so what I want to do is just kind of um, make an offering to my reader. You know, I, I often say to my students, if you're not, conflicted, you're either lying or you're not very smart. And I think that that is um, often, if not always, the case. Yeah, I like the Jonah Gold Goldberg at the LA Times, your colleague there. Um, he's you know, a pretty reliable, conservative voice for the LA Times, especially. But but I also feel he's honest and he, you know, he's struggling with, you know, what is conservatism anyway in the age of Trump, for example? He's been writing a lot about this. And you know, I don't get the feeling like he's Tucker Carlson slamming down my throat, you know, the truth. 
And, uh, but, but that he's wrestling with himself with ideas and that makes me want to engage with him. Yeah. He's more that way now than he was during the Bush era. So we were, uh, on that page, uh, together. I mean, I was a columnist from like 2005 to 2016 or so. So that was the end of the Trump era. I mean, sorry, excuse me, the end of the George W. Bush era and then the Obama era. I think, I feel like I remember Jonah's being a little more, uh, polemical, but yeah, and you know, Trump has forced conservatives to wrestle with their conflicts, wrestle with their own cognitive dissonance a lot. It's funny. I feel like I'm actually just thinking of this now as I talk. I wonder if the Trump era was it, it, it was a time when when liberals got sort of less nuanced in their thinking and and conservatives, real conservatives, small C conservatives, whatever you want to call them, uh, had to really kind of tease out their thoughts and engage with their own sort of sense of of internal conflict. Um, and it's been really interesting to see. You know, my favorite columnist in the New York Times has always been Ross Douthat. Mm, and people yeah. were surprised by that when I was writing on, on the page because I was sort of the, you know, I was a, I was a liberal. Um, although people were a little bit confused by me. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, well, even if I, I, well, that's a good question. I should ask you the same thing. But even if I don't <laughs> agree, you know, I often, I usually don't agree with Ross. But the way he puts a column together, I just think is, is fabulous. I really admire it. He approaches his columns as essays, as sort of thought, um, not thought experiments, but you know, he's really putting his own mind through the paces. And I think that's really, at the end of the day, all we do as, as writers. You know? that, that's not what lends itself to uh, being syndicated all over the place. Uh, you know, if you're neither fish nor fowl, it's kind of hard to get a, get a toehold. But um, that's you know, to, to be, to try to sort out your feelings on the pages is, is much more interesting to me than giving people the same thing every week. Mm hmm. Yeah. I'm not a conservative, but I always enjoyed the writings of uh, Charles Krauthammer, uh, George Will, before him, I guess, William F. Buckley. But, you know, I've read everything that Krauthammer has written and George Will, and I really respect their ideas and their arguments. I mean, I feel like, even though I don't uh, always, I usually don't agree with them, but it's like, at least they're making an argument. You know, then since the Trump era, there's no argument. It's just, you know, this is it's just pure. I don't know what it is. It's not conservativism. Malsy. Yeah, well, Trump's not a conservative. He's a radical. Right. If anything, right. he's an incoherent radical. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's funny because I wrote about George Will. So in my book, The Problem with Everything, which is um, oh, that was quite a quite a journey writing that book, quite a saga. But it, it had many incarnations. But ultimately, it's. It's called my, this subtitle is My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. And it's looking at the current state of mostly feminism, because as a woman, that's sort of what I'm you know, qualified to write about. But it's looking at the Me Too era and sort of various manifestations of social justice culture through the lens of somebody who grew up in the 1970s and 80s um, and had a very different sort of concept of women's rights and the place of women in the world than I think a lot of women do now. And so there was a moment in that book where I talk about, I was teaching at the University of Iowa and the semester, the spring semester of 2017. And I was sitting on the grass attending, um, like they call them take back the night rallies. It wasn't, it, it wasn't at the night, but um, there was a bunch of students out and they would, there was an open mic and they would go up and they would talk about their, their stories of surviving sexual assault. And um, I remember listening to one student and recalling a piece that George Will had written about this very phenomenon. And he talked about um, victimhood being a kind of currency. And this was the piece that got him actually canned at the Washington Post, I think. Oh, right. And right. he Forget said, he said, you know, what what happens now is if you are and this let's mind you this. He probably wrote this in, I don't know, 2000. 16, maybe even before that. Um, if you are a woman on a campus and you um, say that you've been a victim of assault, he says you get automatically sort of brought into this club. You have a community. There's a currency. There's a, you know, you're part of a, of a protected category. And he said it in a really clumsy way. And I guess I'm not entirely surprised that he was 
fired from the post for this. I don't think he should have been. But he was completely right. And what's frustrating is that there's so many of these points are being made by people who kind of, they couch them in terms that are not entirely palatable. And it's hard for people to hear, but they're right. And so for me, what I've been trying to do my whole career is figure out how to say these things in a way that people can hear. And sometimes it takes a long time to say it, and you can't say it in a 700-word column. That's a big part of the problem. Um, but it's just gotten harder and harder to do because people really only hear something as long as a tweet, you know? <laughs> right. 280 characters. Well, maybe that'll change now under uh, uh, Elon. You write in your book here uh, that you were, you were advised to write about feminism because as a straight, cisgender, able-bodied, <laughs> mostly heteronormative white chick. It's the only thing available to you anyway. <laughs> Is <Yeah>. that true? <laughs> yeah, I don't even think we use the word cisgender as much when I started thinking about this book. So uh, yeah, originally the, the book, I was gonna, I started writing the book in like the beginning of 2016. So we all assumed that Hillary Clinton would be the, the, the nominee and, and would be the next president. Okay, so I was going to write a book. Originally, it was going to be called You Are Not a Badass. And I was criticizing this whole sort of vernacular online that you would see a lot of these, you know, the sort of digital feminist blogosphere, the, the, the digital kind of media landscape around young women's culture. You saw a lot of stuff like patriarchal, patriarchal oppression is such that even getting out of bed in the morning and having breakfast and going to work and paying my rent on time is... You know, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm facing down the patriarchy. It's so difficult to be a woman that the smallest, smallest thing is a, makes me a badass, you know. And I hated that. And I didn't understand it at all because, like I said, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s thinking women had every, every right that a man does. And, in fact, the women were doing better. The girls were already doing better in school. Um, and sort of succeeding overall more than boys, even by the time I was graduating from high school in the late 80s. So I was very perplexed by this, and I wanted to look at what had happened. So yeah, to answer your question, the book had been very much about um, feminism. And I was going to write a kind of manifesto, and it was going to be sort of tongue-in-cheek and, you know, a little, little harsh and kind of fun. And, um, and I assumed everybody would be able to handle it because Hillary Clinton would be the president. And when that did not happen, obviously the tone of just public discourse changed overnight. And two things happened. It became clear that I couldn't be as harsh on uh, Me Too feminism and pussy hat marches and all that as I had wanted to. And also the entire social justice landscape was broadening. And we were talking about things like, uh, like, like race and, and gender ideology and a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk about, but it's also tricky for me to talk about. And so it was just really complicated. I mean, I think the book, I like the book a lot and I think it, it does what it needs to do, but it was absolutely excruciating to write. And every day I thank God that I'm not back during that period of my life trying to write that book because it was utter hell. Oh, it's a, it's a great book. I love all your writing. And, you know, to, to what would you recommend somebody do? What I recommend is read people like you just read good writers and i don't know how it works cognitively you just sort of inculcate phrases and vocabulary and structure and i don't know it just it it seems to improve writing by reading people that are good writers yeah funny that right that's that's what they say if you want to write you should read and right. uh, i see more and more people lately saying that you know reading is just uh tldr you know uh we don't want to they they can't they don't have the time to actually read a book and it's right. kind of a crazy idea. <laughs> the people, a lot of people you, you are know, out there trying to write, but they haven't read anything. Right, right. That's right. Yeah, that, and you just have to uh, produce a lot of content and throw it out there, m much of which will go nowhere. You can always save them. I always tell myself, I'll just save this for an essay collection if I don't get it published. Then I don't feel so bad <laughs> putting in the time. But, you know, even the seasoned writer like you and I, we still have to uh, roll up our sleeves and do it and send it out. Maybe it gets rejected, probably gets rejected, you know, and even books. Now, I, this is my conspiracy was my 15th book. Right. And uh, and still I had, you know, had to write proposals and shop it around, 
and make arguments for the case. It wasn't just an automatic, you know, like I'm Stephen King and they'll just publish anything I give them. <laughs> I don't even know like if that's true past, for him. Like in the past, it has been that way for you. <laughs> yeah, never, really. Uh, and so, you know, to keep that in mind. Also, I wonder what you think about this. One of my favorite quips from uh, Christopher Hitchens. Everyone has a book in them. And in many cases, that's where it should stay. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love I love Hitchens. Yeah, he's one of those people that every day you wish he were still alive because you would yeah. love to know what yeah. he thinks about what's going on. But is that true? I mean, in, in the same way that if I watch American Idol and I see all these goofballs who think they have great voices and they're the next big star and they stink. And I think that prob that would be me. I mean, I would just stink. I had no chance of being a, a singer or whatever. And, and probably most people do not have an inner rock star ready to come out. And maybe that's the case for writing. Well, the thing with writing is anybody can literally write. Anybody can, you know, almost anybody, unless you're illiterate, you can put words on the page and string a sentence together. So it's tricky. It's not like music where you have to, if not have mastered an instrument, at least know how to play it or read music or understand what a note is. Um, in, in visual art, you have to have some ability to use certain tools and and be able to, put, I guess, well, I guess you could make the argument that anybody could be like an abstract artist. I mean, there's that whole, my kid could paint that uh, kind of conundrum of, of modern art, what is modern art. But yeah, I mean, writing, it's like, it's not like making a film or making music or, or doing something where you actually need to have training anybody can write a grocery list. And so they think that they can write a book. Um, and the fact is that there's a lot of really bad books out there. And there's a lot of people getting published for reasons that have nothing to do with their ability to, to put ideas down onto paper or on the screen. So it's, it's confusing. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I always just, I suck at everything else. Writing was really the only thing I was good at um, other than playing the oboe, that was my my backup career. I was a I was a serious oboist uh, all the way through college, oh, and uh, yeah, right. I uh, yes, yeah, so I have written about that. Uh, so I figured the only thing slightly uh, more uh, slightly less uncertain than a professional oboe career was being a freelance writer. So here I am. <laughs> right. All right. Let's talk about the subject of your writings. Fem let's start with feminism. First wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave. Give us a, a quick kind of give us a quick breakdown for those. Oh, where are the waves? Well, I mean, yeah. first wave feminism would have been the suffragettes, right? The women around the turn of the you know beginning of the twentieth century, um, early early twentieth century, getting women the vote. Very controversial now because, of course, that was a white woman led movement. Black women did not get the vote at that time, but okay. So the so the first wave was the suffragettes. Second wave, early seventies. The Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan uh, era, um, a lot of that had to do with reproductive rights, um, the idea that you can be raped by your husband. That was revolutionary. Um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on her name? Um, there was a woman who wrote an entire book about this. You know what? I, I will I will come back to it. Anyway, we it'll, all we all we're familiar. Yes, we're all familiar with that um with that with that movement. Susan Brown Miller. Susan Brown Miller oh, against right. our will. That was uh right. yeah, she was the right. one who absolutely uh revolutionized people's minds by like, oh my gosh, you can actually be abused by your by your husband. It was inconceivable. So okay, that's second wave. Third wave is a little tricky because we started to see that around the early 90s. So Rebecca Walker, who's the daughter of Alice Walker, she coined the idea of third wave feminism, which um, that had to do with what we now talk about in terms of intersectionality, intersectional framework, so that um, she was bringing feminism out of a kind of white woman's construct. And it had to do with sort of inter overlapping and interlocking um, notions of power and oppression and that kind of thing. It's a little little harder to define. Um, so the third wave was kind of what people were talking about in the early 90s. Maybe a lot of that also had to do with um, things like you could be raped by somebody you know. So not only can you be raped by your husband, you can be raped by somebody you're on a date with. So the campus sexual assault um, kind of conversation was very much around third wave feminism. Fourth wave feminism is, to me very meme driven. That's 
has to do with the online um, feminist blogs, Jezebel and feministing and uh, all that kind of stuff. And that's where it started to lose me. And this is probably a function of my age, but um, the what we might call fourth wave feminism is the feminism that sort of sees men as, um, you know, having toxic masculinity or mansplaining or manspreading. And, and I think there was a real, there, there was the kind of, to me, it was like the memes were driving the conversation instead of actually thinking about whether or not men were um, being somehow misogynist and oppressive because of the way they sat on a subway seat. The meme sort of did all the talking and it was funny and haha, and we're going to pass this around and we're going to share it on social media. But we didn't really think about what we were saying. At least that was my feeling. And that was what was driving a lot of my uh, ideas in, in the problem with everything. And believe me, the, the millennial uh, activists uh, were not happy with, with what I had to say. Uh, to put oh, really? Oh, no, mm. they hated it. Abs oh, I was excoriated for the problem with everything. All the people in the literary community who had loved me my whole career were suddenly like, uh-oh, she's, she's the enemy now. We don't like her anymore. Absolutely. And specifically, why? What, what did they object to? They just thought I was saying, get off my lawn. I mean, it's funny because there oh, was a, oh. yeah, I mean, in the, I, I, I make a joke in the problem with everything. I, cause the book is an interrogation. I sort of ask myself, am I just, is this just some version of saying, get off my lawn? Am I missing something? Or, and, and, uh, the, uh, the headline of the New Yorker review of very negative review of the book was Megan Dom says to millennials, get off my lawn. It's like, well, <laughs> You know, I was yes. right, right. <laughs> Technically, I have been yes. accused of that because uh, I've I've been critical of wokeness to a certain extent and and some of the trans issues and so I you know basically called you're the old guy on the porch, <laughs> right? You know you you're on the wrong side of history and I don't want to be the guy on the wrong side of history so I try to listen. Um, so here's one of your sentences. Maybe this was what got you in trouble to. Oh, this was in your quote, uh, your neologism, woke ascenti, to des <coughs> describe the class of NPR listening, New Yorker reading, slate podcast downloading elites, once called the cognoscenti. They are now the woke ascenti. Now, I'm, I'm told by my liberal friends, they don't use that word woke in anything like the way critics use it as an insult. Like, oh, you're just one of those wokester types, right? So maybe that's what caused the problem. You're you, maybe you're using it in a way they feel is insulting. Well, woke is so tired now. I try not to use it either. So I that book came out in late 2019. Um, that sentence I think appeared in um, a piece called "Nuance: A Love Story" that I published in 2018. So I think, in fairness, wokeness it, it had not yet um, been sort of wrung out uh, the way it is now. I think that was still okay. I don't think they were. Yeah. I mean, I also, at one point the book was going to be called woke me when it's over. Okay. Um, and, I like uh, yeah, I like that too. Uh, but I also felt like it was a little trollish. Like it wasn't, it was a great title, but I'm not sure it was really the title for this book. It's kind of heartbreaking, but, um, yeah, I, at the time, I don't think the woke Nascenti was the problem. I think it was more just like there, there was a sense that, I somehow didn't have empathy, that I didn't have empathy for people who were marginalized, for people who were suffering, um, that somehow nuance itself, and I think some people really do think this, is a form of oppression because you're asking people who really suffer to look at their experiences and to look at the world in a way that has texture and is complex. And in their minds, that is not fair. And in my mind, it's insulting to say that that's not fair. In my mind, to say that anybody shouldn't be expected to have complicated ideas about their lives because they're somehow oppressed is just reinforcing the victimization. It's mm. totally insulting. And we do it with race all the time now. And we've been doing it to women for in, in the public discourse for easily the last 15, 20 years. And it really makes me mad, frankly. This is the uh, fainting couch feminism, is it? I think it's called, right? Where yeah. you just. Yeah, it was that for a while. And then it's just turned into, you know, this idea of believe women, 
Um, and by the way, uh, often people in my camp, we crit- I, you know, we criticize the sort of the the more blunt, you know, the sort of blunt instrument aspects of the Me Too movement. And people say, oh, well, hashtag believe all women that that never should have been. I'm not sure any serious person really thought that believe all women was something that should have been um, an article of faith. But believe women without the all definitely was. And I don't think we should believe women any more than we should believe men or anybody else. We should give people the benefit of the doubt, I would say, in general, as human beings. And I'm curious what you think about this as a skeptic. Maybe not. But the idea that women are somehow morally superior because we've been um, we, we, because we've been under the thumb of men for centuries, for millennia, and, and therefore we're not going to lie or we're not somehow capable of, of, of manipulation. It's just completely backwards. I mean, women are better gaslighters than men. <laughs> I think by, for, it, for, evolutionary, for, for evolutionary reasons. I mean, to survive, we've had to be better gaslighters because we don't have physical strength. To be emotionally right, manipulative. Yes, right, right. And that's all to me like great, fascinating stuff to think about. And what I sense is that people don't want to think about it. And that's too bad. Yeah, what do I think on this? Uh, I think we should probably in general default to truth that most people most of the time are telling the truth. They're not bullshitting this. They're not lying for the most part. I mean, everybody lies a little bit. Maybe you exaggerate your height or your weight or whatever income on dating sites and whatnot. We know about that. And, you know, studies uh, by Dan Ariely online, uh, you know, where people, subjects are given an opportunity to earn a few bucks per, per whatever the task is. And they, but, but they can score themselves and then turn this, the sheet into the experiment who's in the other room and who doesn't know what they did. And they do, they do cheat. They do lie a little bit, but like 10%, you know, not huge. Right. And uh, so that's normal. So, but to accuse somebody of sexual assault that's pretty serious so given the history i would say take those claims seriously uh but on the other hand whoever the guy is it's almost always in that direction um you know he has a presumption of innocence because you can go to prison for life for that and so there's there's a tough balance there i think it's one thing to socially say you know make those accusations which can be career ending now because of the me too movement um but on the end on the other hand it uh, what the me too movement has done is showing how how is it possible that these guys didn't get the memo back in the 70s and 80s you just don't do that i guess maybe again you get into a position of power and you're just like fuck it i'm just going to do whatever i want rv weinstein or epstein or whoever um because we all got the training and so on in the 80s 90s when i was teaching college we all got the training programs don't sleep with the students yeah i know i know i know we used to do this only, but we're not only doing this date anymore them and marry them <laughs> yeah that's make right. an honest woman out of them <laughs> right right you know and still at um it's still at chapman and we have we every everybody on, on campus has to take these uh, training programs every year and it's like who is this for well apparently there are still some people who don't get the didn't get the memo or something i don't know what it is so yeah, I mean, you you have to listen to those claims. That's the problem with this, right? It's it's so many things. It's never just one thing. So it's absolutely true that there's a lack of due process on the campuses. We have these kangaroo court situations still. So, you know, we don't need to get into the weeds here, but back in 2011, it was the Obama administration that issued the Dear Colleague letter telling all the universities that if they were going to receive federal funding, if they were going to continue to get that, which almost every single one does, private or public, they would have to follow a certain protocol when there was an accusation um, of sexual misconduct. And it was under Title IX, which would guarantee women the same rights in education. And it was sort of folded under that. Anyway, it was a, a mess. And frankly, one of the good things that the Trump administration did was under Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education, she rolled back those those procedures. She said, this is not how you conduct an investigation. This is totally violates all of our principles around due process. And she was right about that. So that's one of those things that people have a really hard time with. They hate Betsy DuVos for all sorts of reasons, rational and irrational. There's plenty of things to 
to disagree with her about for sure. But she was right about that. And now under Biden, we've we've rolled it back. But so we have on one hand this mess around these issues on campuses. But we also you're absolutely right. We've had centuries of men treating women really badly, frankly. And the other thing that's interesting, too, and I wonder what you think of this. A lot of these young women who are, you know, on places like Tumblr and on social media ranting about these things, they have absolutely no idea how bad it used to be. Like, it was really bad. Mad Men is not an exaggeration. If anything, it might be a little too, it, it, ma- it lo- makes it look romantic and fun, right? Um, and so we have this kind of double-edged sword. Like, you know, it's, it's confusing because I'm complaining about the fact that they're complaining. But I'm also saying, you don't, you're not complaining about the right things. It's, it's so much better than it used to be. But then, Michael, like, what do you do with that? You don't want to be like, hey, don't complain because we had to walk 12 miles uphill both ways to school. So it used to be so much worse. And then they're going to say, well, that's your standard. Why can't things get even better? Why should we still be operating with a baseline of something that was really negative for a lot of people? Right. So the norms shift upwards just slow enough. You don't really notice it. And then all of a sudden you have a new generation. Uh, So maybe this takes 20, 30 years to see that change happen. You have to kind of document it historically. But that generation doesn't doesn't really know. They just grew up with this standard. So now, and so here's how I think about it, you know, that we all have a moral sense of right and wrong, and we want to do justice. We want the world to be a better place. I want to participate. What can I do? Okay, well, you know, we've already protested the Vietnam War and civil rights and, and gay rights and so on. What's left? Well, the BLM movement and, you know, the trans movement, and I'm going to get down there and protest. You know, there's a big meeting tomorrow down at City Hall. I'm going down there with my placard. And, you know, then you're featured on Tucker Carlson, campus craziness or, you know, some goofy thing. Libs of TikTok, you know, yes. <laughs> or, yeah, the libs of TikTok. Yes, the libs of TikTok, right, exactly. You know, and so, but, uh, but uh, I try to put it into context. Well, you know, maybe they just want to be engaged and they want to do something, okay? And they look around, well, what is there to do? Okay, here it is. Yep. I don't know. And I don't want to be, you know, I, I try to be, I actually try to be generous. I think people might find this surprising, but you know, the problem with activism, and again, I wonder what you think of this, is activism inherently not nuanced. I mean, my, my podcast partner, Sarah Hader, would say that that's the case. So I, I have two podcasts now, as, as one does. I believe it's of course, come to this. Gotta have it. <laughs> and so um, in addition to The Unspeakable, which is an interview show, I, I do a, this podcast called The Special Place in Hell with, with Sarah Hader. And so we're, we have a more than a 30 year, no, sorry, I keep saying that. She's, a, she's about 30. We've got about a 20 year age difference. Mm, mm. And it's so fascinating to talk with her because she just sees the world really, really differently, even though we're very much aligned with respect to our frustrations around feminism. Um, And so, you know, she will say, and she's been an activist in the, in the atheist space. I'm I'm sure, you know, she, she formed, she's um, an immigrant from Pakistan. She grew up very observant Muslim. And then she uh, became an an atheist. So she, she uh, founded something called the ex ex Muslims of North America. Anyway, so she will say as an activist, that activists are, inherently have blinders on because they have to stay focused on the act. And if they looked at the big picture, they would sort of like lose their minds and not be able to kind of, you know, it, try to achieve their goals. So like I'm kind of the opposite of an activist because I'm constantly trying to think about all the different elements and, you know, pull back and look at the big picture. And I guess we need both in the world, right? Yeah, definitely. The, the the moment you become an activist and maybe you have a nonprofit uh, or some organization and you have the little donate button at the top, you know, you can't really be too nuanced. You got to re- wave the red meat, get the get the the followers to get out there, get the vote. Right. I mean, if you ask like uh, take immigration as an issue, you know, if you ask e- either side on the extremist sides, well, what would a rational immigration policy look like? And it's like, what? No, just close all the borders or no, just open up all the borders. Uh. You know, they have these ex- only extreme positions. Right. So uh, or the, you know, the slave, the, there's this uh, slavery organization. You know, slavery is worse than it's ever been. Wait, 
what? You know, well, they're talking about, you know, slave labor or sex trafficking, which in oh, some of these in uh, other countries. horrible countries, okay. right, yeah. right, right. It's illegal in every country, but it still goes on here. But they'll, they'll make claims like, you know, there's more people enslaved now than ever in history, you know, donate here, right? That kind of thing. So if you break down the numbers and how it's they're counted and so on, that's not something an activist wants to do, right? That's what an intellectual does or a scientist or a scholar or whatever historian, but you know, activists, it's a different animal, I think. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So you're saying that uh, nuance cannot be a cause. <laughs> I, we I, can't I, donate, I would like it but to I be. have, that's, you know, that's my whole brand. I have my, uh, you know, my nuanced oh, right. AF. Uh, oh, nuance. There yes, we go. See? We have a whole merch line. Nuanced as <laughs> well, fuck. So, okay, yes. that's, that's what we need as a nonprofit promoting nuance. <laughs> we are the nuancers. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to the next topic, your favorite topic, trans. I'm going to ask you a really technical, hard question. Megan Dom, what is a woman? Oh, what is a woman? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Adult, human, female. Somebody <laughs> with certain, uh, somebody over a certain age with certain gametes. That's it. You, you know, get an A. <laughs> why, what do you think? <laughs> that is it. You're going to debate me? Debate me, Michael. <laughs> No, I, 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 let's, okay, let's steal, because you and I agree on that, of course, because that's the basic bi biological definition. But, so let's steal, man, with the, somebody else, this fourth wave feminism or uh, woke people or progressives or whatever term we want to use. We don't need to be insulted. Just whatever it is they're arguing, what is they're arguing. It's really more gender than sex, right? And that the gender part, who you identify as, regardless of the size of your gametes or what body parts you have and so on. Okay. I mean, this is so complicated. It's very, you know what? It is at once complicated and not complicated at all. So the, the difference between sex and gender, as I see it, sex is biological. Gender is a performance. Judith Butler is the one that introduced all these concepts when she wrote Gender Trouble. I think it was in the early 90s it came out. And so her idea was that Gender is the performance of your sex. So if you are a biological female, but you perform in a certain way, you, you know, maybe are girly or you put on makeup or you like dolls instead of trucks or whatever it is, that that, that was gender expression. So a, a, a playing with trucks versus dolls is a gender expression. Being biologically male or female is sex. Okay. So we have for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, this trans rights movement that it's so, there's so many different things going on at once. I, there are transgender people, transsexuals. They used to be called transsexuals. And in my view, those are people who really feel that they were quote unquote born in the wrong body, that they're what we would now call gender dysphoria is so severe that the only way to feel better is to medically take, you know, me medicalize yourself so that you are appearing to be the opposite sex and living that way. Okay, I there have always been those people in the world, very very few of them, a very very small percentage of the population, but they've been there. So we have a combination of, um, we have a combination of a lot of people. Um, thinking that this is easier uh, to do than it actually is. And we have medical technology that is making it slightly easier than it used to be, although pretty, still pretty hard. And we have this kind of, um, people really don't like this term, but there's a social contagion. And there's a lot of young people growing up now um, that have a kind of constellation of mental health issues that thanks to um, certain messages that are really pervasive on places like Tumblr and now TikTok, they're getting the message that the cure to all that ails them is to change their sex. And it doesn't make any sense. And I think it's what's really important to understand is that to ask questions about this and to suggest, to point out, it's not a suggestion because it's clearly true, to, to point out that, that there's a social contagion aspect to this is not to say that trans people don't exist or that anybody who identifies as trans shouldn't be given all the rights that anybody else has. Those two things exist at the same time. But we're in this 
kind of ideas landscape that makes it impossible for, as I always say, to walk and chew gum at the same time. People cannot hear these two things at once. And so it becomes completely polarized. And we have, on one hand, the conservatives saying, oh, these people are ruining the world. This is terrible. They're corrupting our children, groomers, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have these people on the other side saying, oh, no, there are so many more trans people than there used to be. And in fact, people can choose their gender and we're going to teach this to third graders and non-binary is a thing. And it's these two extremes being, frankly, really stupid. And there's a lot of people like us in the middle trying to be like, it's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of that. And let's look at this. And like you said, that part in the middle, not very sexy. It doesn't get a lot of traction. It doesn't lend itself to hashtags. So here we are. So the, the, the question to be answered is, what's the actual percentage of trans? You know, I mean, the, the number you talked about that's always been around, it's, you know, like some fraction of, a, of 1%, you know, maybe one tenth of 1%. It's pretty small, right? Transsexual, you know, actual like mixing up of, of your gametes and your body part, whatever, you know, just the kind of genetic stuff. Okay. Uh, and then all of a sudden in the last five years, there's been a spike in like, 2,000%, 4,000%. 4,000%. Yeah, dependent. Yeah. So the question is, what's the cause of that spike? And the one answer, one hypothesis is that uh, society's more tolerant, open, liberal, accepting. So these are people that are coming out of the closet like gays did, let's say. And the other side is the social contagion one. Okay. So if it was the first hypothesis, then that coming out should happen in all age cohorts across the board, right? So 13 to 19 and then 20 to 25 and then 26 to 35 and so on. But that isn't what's happening, right? Right. And they would say, well, that's because people who are older, they've already internalized so much transphobia that they're afraid to come out. So th they can always go to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to be clear, though. So intersex is a totally separate issue. The other okay, problem yes, is right, that people, right. you know, intersex as a as a category encompasses so many things. I mean, that can be any anything from what we used to call true hermaphrodism oh, right. to yeah. very, very, very minor variations in um kind of, you know, presentation, you know, just length of genital pieces. Like any tiny variance will be classified as intersex, even if the person could go their whole life and not even know they had it. It's totally negligible. So it gets really confusing. But intersex has nothing to do with sexual orientation or or gender identity. But the trans activists, you know, they like to lump everything together. That's why we have LGBTQI now, right? Even A. Now asexual is somehow in under this umbrella. I mean, it's it's a total mess. The problem with trans activism as it currently exists is that it's utterly incoherent. But they've also weaponized their own sense of oppression to the point where if you ask any questions or God forbid point out that it's incoherent, then you're transphobic. So they've actually shut down the conversation. What, you know, what really concerns me about this, Michael, is that it's a, it's a inherently homophobic movement because what's happening is that we're seeing a lot of young kids who are gay and they're just, you know, they're, they're presenting quote unquote as maybe having characteristics of the opposite gender. You feel like a little boy who's very feminine feminine, or a girl who's a little masculine. Probably those are gay kids. Maybe not, but, you know, chances are pretty good. And instead of being accepted for as they are, for being gay, they're being facilitated into this psychosocial experiment um, and, and medically transitioned. And the schools are participating in the medical community and the, and the therapist community and parents are being absolutely uh, coerced into going along with something that they don't understand. It's really, really alarming. And I hate to sound hysterical, but um, I think it's worthy of a little hysteria. Yeah, there are um, some of the people that track it, like um, Chris Rufo and Abigail Schreier, not quite as much, but they're kind of on the conservative side. So people go, yes. oh, they're, what do you expect? Yes, they're that's conservative. the problem. Yes. And then, but then I had Helen Joyce on the show, and she's pretty liberal. I mean, she says, yes. I'm a liberal. She seems pretty liberal. Nor maybe you're, you're kind of liberal, second wave liberalism or whatever. Feminism, Classical liberalism. liberal, whatever Classical that means. Classical liberal, yes. whatever mm -hmm. the term is. Yeah. 
And yet she's also concerned. I guess the question is, uh, I suppose it depends on the country and in the United States, I suppose it depends on the state. To what extent can these schools or medical centers do these things to minors without parental knowledge? Yeah, I mean, they can't obviously do surgery on a kid um, without parental knowledge. And I think, yeah, it does. It definitely does depend on the state. But one of the things that happens, for instance, I believe this happens in Seattle public schools. The kid goes in, say, sixth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, whatever, and says to the class or the teacher, I want to identify as the opposite gender, opposite sex. I want a new name. I want new pronouns. But don't tell my parents because they're transphobic and they'll kick me out of the house. And according to the statistics and according to what I read on the Internet, I will then become suicidal. I mean, that does happen. The kid doesn't have to say all that. The kid can just say one thing. I want new pronouns. Don't tell my parents. In some school districts, the school is obligated not to tell the parents. The parents become like an enemy, uh, like an enemy state. And it's people think that this isn't actually happening. I mean, I just have constantly have conversations where they go, well, that's not really happening. And look, I don't have kids. I don't know firsthand that it's happening, but I've asked people again and again and again who are in these situations and in these school districts, and they say, yes, it absolutely is. So that's, that is something that's going on. And then this idea that, uh, that there's no surgeries going on for kids. Well, this depends on how you define kid. Is there, is there surgery going on for a nine-year-old? Are, are, are five-year-olds being put on puberty blockers? No, because they don't need them because they're not at puberty yet. So this is the other way that people like Chase Strangio and these other activists get around these talking points. Um, but we've got a lot of 15-year-olds getting double mastectomies. That is, that is well-documented. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's irreversible. In Abigail Schreier's book title, Irreversible Damage. It's not the same as getting a tattoo or dyeing your hair purple or <laughs> painting your fingernails or whatever. It's You can't reverse it, right? So what if they change their mind? So then the question, I guess, from a scientific perspective is, at what age are you really an adult? Right. Well, so we know like the Supreme Court uh, had that case back, I don't know, like 25 years ago, where you can't execute a minor for murder uh, because their brains are not fully developed. Uh, so then the, kind of the developmental psych research on that was like, really early 20s before maybe 25 before your your, your prefrontal cortex the break on the impulses right. that are bubbling it's up like an from insanity your limbic plea. system yes it's a little bit like that yes right so maybe we could apply it to that saying um you know it's one thing to have different pronouns or dress differently or whatever but you're really not you really just don't know until you're maybe your right. early 20s uh, i mean when do gay people say they feel gay well very early but when do they actually, I don't know, act on it or whatever, but, but they're not changing, they're not doing any medical stuff. It's just who you're attracted to is a different question than who you identify as. It's really hard. And I'm also wary of making this too analogous to the gay thing. It definitely overlaps with it. And it's totally germane because a lot of, like I said, a lot of kids who are gay are being facilitated into, into gender transition. But, you know, at the same time, People who are transgender, people who are true, I hate, you know, again, this is considered hate speech, hate mm -hmm. speech, true trans. A yeah, lot of them did trans, know, right. a lot of them did know when they were very young. So right. I'm not going to sit here and say there's no such thing as a transgender kid. I know a lot of, um, a lot of people who are pretty much aligned with my thinking on this will say that they don't think there's such a thing as a transgender kid. I'm not quite prepared to say that because I think there are transgender people and they were, and they were once kids. So and I can absolutely imagine how excruciating it must be to know or to deeply believe that you are really meant to be the opposite sex of what you were assigned at birth, whatever, and know that you're about to go into puberty and develop more of the characteristics of that sex. And that will make it so much harder for you to pass when the time comes that you're able to medicalize and have surgery. I 100% get that, especially if you're a biological male and you really, really think you're female and somebody is saying, okay, fine, you can do whatever you want when you're 18, but you can't do it now. And you're about to hit puberty and you're going to, it's going to make it really tough for you to, to pass later on. I get that, but I don't know. I don't know what the solution is given that we have an enormous cohort here that 
is pretty clearly not trans and there's a lot of other stuff going on. And we have a culture that for reasons that I just still cannot fathom is wanting to facilitate them and, and really thinking that this is somehow a sign of progress and tolerance in a society when to me it's a sign of like the twilight zone. <laughs> I mean, is mm-hmm. this what we call mass formation delusion? Am I, am I, does that term oh, yes. apply? That's what one, does that well, mean? That's one, that's one term. Well, just more of a kind of a social movement, I suppose, that really takes off quickly. Right. So it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, like uh, I'm a young person. I want to engage in some act, social activist program. What can I do? What's the next thing? Gay rights, women's rights, all done. Oh, trans rights. That's it. That's the one I'm going to uh, hook on to and sink my moral teeth and righteousness sense of uh, right self righteousness and so on uh, emotionally into that and I think a lot of it is that so that's why you get the well you're transphobe if you're not a hundred percent on board well I'm not transphobe and I'm not going to put up with that so you have to make an argument you can't just right. use a name right so you know we can just outline exactly what we said you know what are the numbers what's the percentage what's how old do you have to be before you know and so on uh, although I said I guess I think I think you might have just said this or hinted at it that. Their argument would be if you don't start the hormone treatments pre-puberty, then it's going to be too late to really be your true self after you've gone through puberty as an adult, right? Is that the argument? Yeah, but the problem is that it you really can't, you, you, you're not going to have a normal sexual adulthood. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on there because mo- the vast majority of the, of the kids who are saying that they are trans and that, and that they want to go on puberty blockers, et cetera, are going to end up desisting, not being trans, probably being gay or lesbian. The tiny percentage that are actual trans, you know, frankly, we just don't have the the data because this this cohort is so, so new. I mean, they have statistics like, well, 90% uh, who transitioned as adolescents are happy with the transition 10 years later, 20 years later. That may be, but that's an entirely different cohort. They're studying the people who you know, we're presenting well before this was all over social media. You know, that's, it's not the same group. That was before the 4,000% increase. So you're comparing apples to oranges. I mean, what's, what's frustrating about this is that there's no data, A, because this is such a recent phenomenon, but B, because a lot of the gender clinics, they're just not keeping track because the vast majority of the people who desist, who detransition, don't go back to the clinic. They just stop taking the drugs. They don't go back to the clinic and say, hey, clinic, just want to let you know I'm not doing this anymore. It's kind of like when you check out of the hotel. Like, you know, you could just, you check out of the hotel, you just sort of walk out. You don't necessarily, you know, your credit card is on file. They will charge you accordingly. You don't really have to go to the front desk and say, hey, Grand Hyatt, here's my little key card. I'm checking out. Bye. Um, So it's, it's, it's incredibly complicated to follow. And what frustrates me is that because it's so complicated, most people either don't pay very much attention or they just go along with what they perceive to be the right side of history and they conflate it with the gay rights movement. And they say, well, if you're saying that kids aren't really trans, that's just like saying that gay people aren't really gay and that they should go through conversion therapy. And how dare you? That was a terrible thing. That was a terrible thing, but this is not the same thing. And people need to understand this. And until, you know, Abigail Schreier wrote a really important book. I think that's, it's a really excellent book actually. But if we only have Chris Rufo and Abigail Schreier on one side and the extreme trans activists on the other side and the people like Helen Joyce and Jesse Single and, you know, Sasha Ayad and Stella O'Malley and me and, Colin Wright and many, many other people who are making very reasoned, rationed arguments, rational arguments and asking very rational questions. If we're not at the center of this, it's it's only going to get worse. And again, the nuanced people, it's not the sexy position, you know, it's not hashtagable. So it's really, really difficult. Yeah, I know, Jesse. He's such a good guy, and he's so careful with his words and his so data and so on. And still, he just gets hammered relentlessly online. Mm-hmm. Terrible. I had a trans student a couple of years ago at Chapman. Um, so I have these um, first-year foundation courses that I teach. So these are right out of high school. And she, in the mid-semester, said, you know, I am I'm, I'm identify as a male now. 
and she changed her clothes, cut her hair, changed her name. So now it's a he. And okay, so I'll just use the male pronoun now. So, but it became clear to me after a few weeks that he didn't want to be a he, a male, a man, he wanted to be trans. It's like, I see, it's the trans thing that's happening here, not the male thing. Cause you just do whatever you want to do. I don't care. Just, but why do we have to talk about it? But you know, it's a seminar class. So it came up a lot. And the more it came up, the more attention, you know, the other students are like, oh my God, what's it? So what's it like? What are you going to do? And you know, tons of attention love bombing i think this is called uh, but but just mm-hmm. curious just curious like and and accepting of course that's fine i was accepting you do, whatever just please finish the course I, and she just <laughs> i think she ended up dropping i tried to talk her don't do it until the summer wait till the summer you know because this is obviously it's in, she wasn't turning in her assignments and so on and it's like okay uh, uh, so i think there's some of that on the other hand like i know deidre mccluskey who's a world-renowned economist historian and i knew her when she was donald mccluskey back in the early 90s and so she's you know wrote a whole book about this and a, a, just a heartbreaking essay about how her family rejected her and they still won't talk to her and it's you know and she's just the nicest person really smart just great and you know to have that your own family not speak to you this just is heartbreaking so there's that yeah I mean, but Deir- Deirdre McCloskey is an example of what I guess I would call true trans. Again, I, people really hate that phrase, but I, I, I suspect your audience can handle it. She's not making being trans the center of her identity. She's an economist. That's what she does. Like, this is not a lifestyle. It's, it's something that she did because she felt she had to do it because her gender dysphoria was so extreme that this was the only relief. There's lots of people like that. Buck Angel is a friend of mine, trans man. And he transitioned, I think, when he was in his mid 30s, now probably close to 60. It wasn't a lifestyle choice. It was something that he felt he had to do. And he acted, you know, he is an activist and he's very much on the side of kids should wait. There should be you know, that adolescent gender medicine has gotten completely out of control. I mean, plenty of trans people are not in favor of the current state of trans activism, by the way. When we talk about trans activism, we're talking about a particular cohort of trans people, not most of them, frankly. Most trans people are just living their lives, not a political position. There's plenty of trans people that are like Republicans, you know, it's not a political choice or it's not a it's not a it's not a political ideology. Caitlyn it's, Jenner. Right. Caitlyn Jenner is a Republican. As far as I know. Trump supporter, so I don't know if that makes you a Republican or what. But <laughs> right. uh, so like a lot of movements, it it gets swept up as a as a vehicle of style. I mean, we saw this during the hippie movement. I wasn't alive back then, but from what I understand and talking to people, you know, obviously plenty of people very vehemently opposed the war and had very strong um thoughts about things and were really willing to put their money where their mouths were. But a lot of people just liked the clothes and the music and they wanted to go to the festivals and they wanted to have a certain kind of aesthetic. And I think that you see that with this a lot. The problem is that the aesthetic in many cases involves irreversible medicalization and surgery. And that is unprecedented. And frankly, that's why I find this so fascinating. I don't really care what people do with themselves, frankly, especially if they're over 18. I don't care at all. But the kind of, the kind of way that everybody is pretending to go along with something that is obviously a house of cards and everybody, meaning the cultural institutions, the universities, the corporate HR departments, the media companies, everybody knows better, but they're nodding along because because they're afraid of something that to me is fascinating. This is called uh, pluralistic ignorance or the spiral of silence where everybody thinks everybody else thinks one thing, but in fact, most of them don't. But until, you know, the, until the boy points out the emperor has no clothes on, right? Everybody just keeps their mouth shut just in case and cancel culture makes it worse. Um, you know, politically, if you don't have a free press, th- those things can hover around for a long time. You know, everybody loves the dictator when in fact they don't. Um, and in this case, we have free media, but 
the cancel culture thing uh, acts as a kind of c- censor of those ideas. Yes. The cancel culture is the dictator, right? Right, right. It's amazing because we know that the vast majority of Americans, people in the West, don't like, quote unquote, wokeness. We know that people just want to live their lives. But somehow, I don't know, this isn't selling, this isn't getting clicks. Like, this isn't, the algorithm is not favoring it. I don't know. I'm okay not talking to people, but I don't really want to know how they have sex. I'm just, it's the, you know, in terms of communication, what do these words even mean if they don't, if if you use them any way you want and they change that, those usage change every couple months? Yeah. And, but on the other hand, language is fluid. You know, people like me and and you probably, we roll our eyes at Latinx or, or, you know, MX, you know, those sorts of pronouns. But the fact is that Ms. as a pronoun was widely mocked back in the 70s when it rolled around and everybody made fun of it and it was just a punchline. And now it's just taken for granted. It would be weird not to be called Ms. So I think we have to be mindful of that. Um, I guess, you know, what just, what a part of the reason I think, especially I think women in my generation are really fascinated with this topic, Helen Joyce. Um, me, any, any number of us is because, especially as girls, and this gets back to a lot of what the problem with everything is about. It's about growing up in the seventies and the eighties. I'm a Gen Xer. At that time, being a tomboy was cool. Like in the seventies, if you were, I was, you know, I was born in 1970. Okay. So I was in elementary school growing up in the seventies. If you were a girly girl, if you were playing with dolls, if you were playing with Barbies and putting on makeup and glitter, that was kind of like you're kind of a loser. It's sort of uncool. Like you wanted to be like doing sports or being like Dorothy Hamill or Nadia Comaneci. Like I always say, like it's no accident that the the biggest child movie star of the 1970s was Jodie Foster, who was like a little like little tomboy, like grew up to be a lesbian. Christy McNichol, biggest child television star, lesbian. Okay, that was the aesthetic. And in the 80s, it was still. It, we, you know, obviously there was all kinds of sexual exploitation, but you did not have the gender binary, the extreme gender stereotypes that started to creep up in the 90s. You did not have the Disney princess phenomenon yet. You did not have ubiquitous pornography online. You didn't have this hypersexualization, the girls gone wild raunch culture that you started to see in the 2000s. That hadn't come around yet. And so there was a real sense of us as girls is just, we could be kind of, you know, if we were a little bit masculine or whatever, or have short hair, or like that didn't make you, it didn't make you a boy. It didn't even make you a lesbian. Like it was just a, a particular, it was a style. It was a particular way of being a girl and a woman and the world. And boys had much less leeway that way. Like, let's be very clear. This was a privilege afforded to girls at that time. But I think what frustrates and scares us so much now is that we're seeing the the lanes or narrow that's so much narrower so these girls growing up now they think oh well i want to play soccer and i don't like dolls therefore i must be a boy and that's really really sad and scary and that's i think a lot of what we're teasing out here we're not we're not being transphobic we're looking at the culture and asking how all this came to be right it may be another decade before this sorts itself out although i am predicting if uh if there are enough detransitioner, uh, desisters, I guess they're called, right? Detransitioner. Uh, yeah, I think that's a little bit of a different thing, but yes, de- detransitioners are going to lead the way. Yes. Right. So if if they got the surgery and no one, there was no adult in the room to, to advise them about this, and then they regret it and they sue the medical centers or the doctors, or whoever, that could bring a a pretty swift end to it. Yeah. Well, that's how we came to the end of the recovered m- memory syndrome, right? Oh, right. Right. This is like yeah. a recovered memory, recovered memory writ large. I think you and I talked about yes. this a little bit. Right. Yes. Because it's still based on this kind of Freudian idea that there are hidden unconscious forces in here that I need to suss out through therapy or whatever the modality is. And then I will know who my true, what my true inner self is. And the fact is, as far as we know, that that isn't how the brain works, right? I mean, if you, like with recovered memory, if you have a new memory, 
you've you've reconstructed your memory through uh you know some thought experiment or therapy or hypnosis or whatever the old memory is now gone it's not like it's still in there and then and the new memory is covering it up and you can get back to the old memory it's according to elizabeth loftus and other memory researchers it's rewired it, it's gone right and so this is the problem with planting those ideas in people's heads like elizabeth's famous experiments about the lost in the mall experiments do you remember those uh where she had adult subjects whom she had screened and talked to their family and so on and they were never lost in a mall, right? But they, now, they, so in a series of questions, interview style with these subjects, she would ask them, do you remember when you were lost in, in the mall? You know, your, your, your parents were telling us about the, oh yes, oh, it was a traumatic experience. And I, I remember how I felt. And then the person that found me had this flannel shirt on. And then I heard my mom's name over the loudspeaker, on and on and on, these incredible details of something that never happened wow. by just asking the question. Yep. I mean, you can see why people give false confessions, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, right. Yeah, maybe I did do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's not yeah. a video recorder in there. There's something hidden in it, right? So I think sometimes I think some of the gender stuff is a little bit like that. You know, who's my real self? And it's very seductive, right? I mean, to think like, oh, I'm unhappy in life. I don't, I don't like where I am. I don't like myself. I don't have any, I can't form connections. It must be because there's something deep inside me uh, and it would be very simple to, to flip it around. There's a very simple solution here. You know, I, right. what do you think about this too, Michael? Like people are really into astrology these days. Have you noticed that? Like mm -hmm. there seem, especially um, young women. I, I was talking to a, mm. a high school kid boy who was telling me that, like a lot of these girls, they like won't date certain guys if their astro astrological signs don't line up. Mm. Like they take this very, very <laughs> seriously. So I wonder if there's this kind of ethos of magical thinking um, just in general. And, you know, on, on, it, it can range from something, you know, as something like astrology, something as innocuous as what's your sign, to I got to change my entire gender because mm -hmm. I, I want an easy answer to the complications of my life. That's, this is like conspiracy theories, right? Yes. It's interesting. Yeah. That's actually an interesting analogy because the entire occult is based on the idea that there are hidden forces. That's what the occult means. Hidden forces, like the secret, you know, Oprah's the secret. Uh, you know, you just wish you had uh, success and wealth and so on. And then the universe will give it to you because you make it happen. And oh, so on. yes. You visualize and it will manifest. You visualize yes. it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So are you saying all those poor people in Africa, Oprah, those African, those black people are just yeah. thinking bad thoughts? I mean, really? That's Their the origins of poverty? Their vision boards are not up to <laughs> snuff. Yeah. 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 So it's something like that, I think, probably a, a touch of that. Yeah. Could be. All right. Let's talk about um, sex because <laughs> we're kind of on that subject. Uh, I'm having uh, Louise Perry on the podcast in a oh. couple of weeks. And there's several books along those lines. Hers is The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. There was one or two others like that. Uh, Bridget Fetisi wrote that essay recently uh, that she said took her a couple of years to write. You know, my, uh, I forget what it was called, but basically, oh, you know, being a my, slut? yeah, my, my, my horrible <laughs> background as a slut. Um, and there's this, it seems to be a kind of a, a regret of like having sex like a man. And so what are your thoughts on, you know, was the sexual revolution, what were the good parts of the sexual revolution? And is this really one of the bad parts of the sexual revolution? Yeah, well, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Obviously, right. there were good yeah. parts of the sexual revolution. Just again, watch Mad Men. I don't <laughs> think anybody could argue that things have gotten better. Um, the, the advent of the birth control pill was huge. It was revolutionary. I mean, it wasn't, now I think, and again, I talk about this in my book. It's only been, what, the last 50 years? 60 years that anybody had any control over their lives really at all, men or women. You don't have control over your reproduction. You don't have control over your life. And it wasn't just women's lives that were profoundly affected by that, but men as well. You know, until recently, you either died in childbirth or at war. You know, you had a pretty, pretty, good, pretty good chance of either of those happening. So I think that it's easy to say that the sexual revolution was was overreach, that um, it's resulted in women being told that they can behave like men or that they should want to have sex like men and that they should, you know, that, that, that having families is not as valuable as having careers. You know, there's a whole bunch of 
talking points that come along with that. And I think there's a lot of validity to them. I think they're definitely worth teasing out. But at the end of the day, you ask, you got to ask yourself, is your, is your life as a woman, if you're a 30 year old woman in 2000, you know, 22, is your life better than it would have been in 1922 or 1952 or even 1982? Now, I mean, I would say in 1982, if you were a girl, you would be allowed to play with trucks and they wouldn't facilitate a gender transition. But OK, <laughs> but that but that aside, you're right. There, there's a lot there's a lot that's better. But I think that Louise is fantastic and she she's extraordinary because she's talking about this stuff and not being shot down. And I'm, I'm very I, I have my theories as to why hmm. some of the reasons why. But, um, you know, she's why? in her view. Well, she's British, first of all. If you're mm. and so is Richard Reeves. So he has this book of boys and men. He's talking yeah, about yeah. what's happened with boys. If you're British, you can get away with this, partly because Americans love the accent. You're automatically <laughs> yes. have gravitas. But more importantly, they don't have a Christian right over there. They mm. they don't live in fear of of the the right wing weaponizing your arguments and using them mm. and using against you. So same thing with the trans stuff. Believe it or not, they are it's very fraught still, but they're having more conversations around trans activism over there than than we are but you know i think that louise makes a really good point um despite everything that that you know women were not really being being told honestly that their fertility drops off after a certain age i think a lot of people a lot of women grew up thinking that they could start families well into their mid 30s into their late 30s we see that we see celebrities doing that we see, you know, there's a real fetishization of having a big career and having a family, um, doing it all, that kind of thing. And so I really like the way this new generation of feminists, I don't know if she would call herself a feminist, uh, women are, are pointing these things out. But I think we have to do both. And I think Richard Reeves does this very well. He's pointing out all the things that are happening to men, partially because of the women's movement, but saying you know, we, we need to have uh, let men catch up with women. This isn't about taking anything away from women. It's about helping this other side. It's it's both and it's not one or the other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, so I've just pulled up this graph here uh, that that it, you, you don't have to see what the graph details are. The question is, if the conditions were right, would you consider having sexual intercourse with someone you viewed as desirable? If you had known that person for one minute, so you know who the blue lines are. Uh -huh, uh -huh. This is the green lines, They're right? Pretty, These, oh, oh, I see. Yes, yes. It, mm -hmm. It's different countries in 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 Europe, and oh. the blue lines are the blue lines are, of course, the men. And you know, so this is Louise's point, but this is the point that you guys, all, all you have been making, is that men and women are not the same in terms of uh, number of partners desired, kind of variation. You know, the amount of times you, time you spend. Uh, thinking about sex. Yeah, these are mating strategies. It's not like <laughs> right. we're being prudes. It's just that, right. you know, if you want the species to go on, women are programmed to, you know, want a mate who's going to invest. I mean, we all, we know all this. Men, it's, right. it's in their reproductive right. interest to spread their seed and it's in women's reproductive interest to, you know, get a high status man and keep him at home. And see, again, the feminists hate when you make yes. this kind of point. Yes. They absolutely Why? hate it. Well, because it's been weaponized. Because the problem is that you try to say something very clearly about what is true, and it's not necessarily what's good. This is a naturalistic fallacy, right? So, you know, we're, we're trying to just say these are the facts. Um, it, we're not saying they're good or they're bad, but this is what nature has delivered to us. They absolutely hate it because it gets weaponized by people who are then anti-feminist say, well, therefore, women should stay home in the kitchen and they shouldn't be out in the workplace at all. And it's, again, it's this utter lack of nuance and um, people are already predisposed to not being nuanced, but the, the media culture has utterly, has made it so much harder. You know, the first guest ever on the Unspeakable podcast was, was Heather Hying, um, the evolutionary biologist. And we talked a lot about this. She and I are almost exactly the same age. We grew up in very similar circumstances, very similar concepts of ourselves as women. Um, and so we talk a lot about this, uh, and it's still really hard for people to hear. And, you know, it's just like, as she said, just because something is true 
doesn't make it right. And as I say, you know, Mother Nature is the ultimate misogynist. <laughs> That's right. It's not yes, fair, exactly. right? It's not so much is not fair, but that doesn't make it untrue. And not only weaponized as part of that, but also the kind of blank slate. There is no human nature part of the left thinking about these things. I call them cognitive creationists. You know, evolution only happened from the from the neck down up above. It's just a blank slate. But as Baker points out, it can't be a blank slate. The, the environment has to operate on some physical system. And that system was built by genes. Right. right. And, and they play you know, off of each other, of course. Right. I mean, right. society can exacerbate some of these things. It's constantly in motion, but it's not, it's not one or the other. It's both yeah. w working yeah. with and against each other. Right. Well, I mean, from a guy's perspective, I'll tell you, I mean, the data is pretty accurate. Like, how often do you think about sex? How many partners would you like to have? How long, how many dates do you need to go on before you have sex? Still, you know, even for, as for, you get older, doesn't it, doesn't it well, uh, fall yeah, no, off no, at it's a certain it's point? Definitely wane, it's definitely wane for sure. I, I'm 68. I, I only think about sex like once an hour instead of once a minute now. Oh, okay. <laughs> how long have we been on this call? I'll, yeah, uh, I've already thought okay. about it twice. Okay. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, but, you know, also I should point out, you were talking about the nostalgia effect. You know, when you're single and you're just dating and you have no idea if you're going to get lucky tonight or if this is going to turn into something uh, deeper, which also, you know, men are not just pigs. You know, we actually like to be in relationships and, and be married. It's a nice thing. Uh, but when you don't, when you're in that, like as a writer, you don't know if that piece is going to get accepted or not. The date tonight, I have no idea what's going to happen. And so much of the time <laughs> is just spent being anxious and like, uh, you know, it's uncertain, it's uncomfortable, you know, we're like in, in two months from now, will I have somebody that I, I want to be with? I have no idea. And, you know, I spent years like that in my twenties. It's like, this is not fun at all. I remember one of my college professor friends, uh, when I was married at the time, so I was in my thirties, he came in one day and he said, boy, I finally, he's a single guy. I finally had one of the weekends that you married guys think we have every weekend. <laughs> So in other words, you think, oh, these Orgy? those single guys, they get oh, sex okay. every every day. It's right. gonna be great. And then, you know, of course it it doesn't it doesn't work that way, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's especially hard, I you know, when you're in your twenties and thirties and there's you feel like you have to find the person, right? It's not it's not only am I gonna connect with somebody, you know, physically or otherwise, it's like, oh, is this gonna be the one? Is this gonna be the person I'm gonna have a family with? And I think that's true for men as well. I mean, that's the stereotype of women, but so, yeah. One right. of the nice things about being older uh, <laughs> right. and being single is you don't have that. I mean, it's actually right. quite, you know, to live that way, it's really tyrannical in, in, a, in a certain <laughs> right. sense. If you're constantly oh, looking for not just anybody or somebody, but the person. That's kind of a terrible way to live. All right. Let's wrap this up by talking politics. Here we are on November 14th, a uh, week after the uh, midterms. It looks like, you know, Trump may not be back or, I mean, he'll, he'll announce tomorrow. I love the way back, it's just been decided. The media has <laughs> decided <laughs> we're not going to talk about Trump anymore. I know. It's astonishing. Fox News. Okay, we got All the memo. All it took was for them to just say. <laughs> they could have just said it, decided at any given point. But right. OK. Funny how that works. OK. But what, what I want to ask you about is, is how is it I, I can know uh, just one position that you hold, gun control, abortion, immigration, whatever. And I can predict with pretty high certainty what your position will be on all the other issues, even if I know nothing about you. Um, because we are binary. I don't know. <laughs> Here we are saying that, you know, non-binary is a bullshit thing. <laughs> When we Maybe talk about the gender discussion, but I think being politically non-binary is important. Yeah, I don't understand why it's so hard to see the benefit in looking at things on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. Right. You have one kind of opinion about immigration and another kind of opinion about abortion, and that's entirely possible. People contain multitudes. And in fact, people who don't follow politics and are not on Twitter all day, normal people just out there in the world, working class people, they think all kinds of things. I mean, if right, you ever go to like right. a factory floor and listen to people talking to each other all day about politics and whatever else, they have every kind of opinion. Mm. They're, most people are all over the place, mm. I think. It's the pundit class that's not allowed to be all over the place. And they're setting the tone. And so we think that that's just how it is. 
that's why I think the two party system, I, 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 it's, it feels unsustainable to me, but it's also kind of irreplaceable. The two party system is, is, is deceptive. Um, it doesn't reflect uh, just sort of the variety of, of opinion that, that most people hold. Um, there needs to be a cafeteria style approach. Y yeah, I know. Well, like in Germany where my wife's from, they have like six parties and none of them get more than like 15, 20%. So they have to have these coalitions and make uh, deals with each other and so on that. Yeah. I like that idea, but how come we don't have that here? I don't know. What do you think? You're <laughs> older than me. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I asked political scientists, they, they say it has to do with gerrymandering and, and how the parties get money. And you, we, basically we ended up with a duopoly for the last century or so. And they have so much power. It's almost impossible for a third party to get any kind of toehold and challenge it. It's just the machine right. is too big. Uh, it, the momentum is just too massive. It'd be like, it'd be like introducing a new search engine. Now, you know, I hear these advertised periodically on these conservative websites, you know, you, you don't want to go on Google. Well, good luck with that. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Or everybody's you know. going to quit Twitter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like, okay. I've already heard ads for some of these alternatives to Twitter just in case Musk closes it down. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll flip over there and I'll have six followers instead of whatever I have, a couple hundred thousand. So, I mean, it's like the, the, the market momentum is so powerful. And I think politics is probably like that. Although George Lakoff points out the, um, the, uh, he studies moral psych, sort of the moral psychology of politics that con conservatives embrace So he's into metaphors. So the metaphor of the government, like a family. So for the conservatives, it's like a strict father family model. And for liberals, it's like a nurturing mother family model. And that this ties together many things. Like when I say, how come conservatives say they believe in autonomy and liberty and freedom of choice? And then I say, well, how about women's reproductive rights? Well, not them. How about gays getting, no, not them. It's like that right. they're not in favor of individual autonomy and free choice. They're in favor of a strong moral foundation to a group that you need a strict father to enforce those rules and so on. This is why they're so into religion as being has to be part of our political system because you need a strong father up there to enforce the rules or else people are going to be bad. They, they, they're, they, they don't have a blank slate model. They have kind of a dark human nature model of who we are, right? And liberals are like, Mar, no, no, we can, t it's more blank slate. We can raise kids to be nurturing and loving and empathetic and so on. You just have to create the right environment for them and so on. So this ends up um, kind of determining your position on a lot of these different issues. So mm -hmm. abortion, for example, well, these women, they just need to quit getting pregnant. Well, what about birth control? Oh, well, it's not consistent. They should just be, you know, just say no, like, you know, Nancy Reagan and drugs, just say no. <laughs> right. Right. Now, that this isn't realistic, but well. that's the, the, the his point is that that's where they're coming from. You know, guns, you got to have guns because, uh, you know, you, you need a strong family father with a gun to protect the family. You know, the, this kind of ties these things together. Anyway, I'm just kind of rambling on this, but it's an interesting. Is there something psychological underneath these issues that is more foundational to why gra people gravitate toward one party or the other? Well, but I yeah, but by his own argument. People need two parents, right? I mean, again, I know this is conservative. You, you know, ideally, you have a mother and a father, if not mm -hmm. under under one roof in your life. Everybody is made. Okay, here we go. Here's how we can think about this. Each we're we're both made from a mother and father. We contain both of those uh, forces within us. Mm -hmm. So you would think that everybody on you know on the most basic sort of intuitive cognitive level is going to want a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. There's about, there's a, there's an intrinsic need to have balance, even if we grew up in a single parent household. I don't know. I'm just riffing here. There's, yeah, there's yeah, gotta yeah. be something yeah. there. Yeah. But we're not, nobody's one thing. I just think that we, we need to start having more imagination about our own minds, literally, like just allow yourself to think about what you might be curious about. I mean, that's, that's why that's why I have the own speakeasy. I mean, I've started an mm. entire enterprise to get women mm -hmm. together to be able to talk about these things because women are very tribal and very worried about being judged by other women and thrown out of the group. And so I think women mm. are even less likely to talk about these things than men. Um, and so it's been really, really fascinating and satisfying to to bring women together. And, you know, people can have 
different kinds of opinions about different things. And I've had people, oh, we disagree about abortion actually in this group, but we agree about other things. And mm. what's important is that we can feel free to have these conversations. And it's, 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 people are ravenous to get away from these sorts of restrictions on thought and, and packages that we get put in and we put ourselves in. And so I, I hope that maybe there's, you know, what we've seen in the midterms is some sense of the moderates mm -hmm. prevailing and the moderates will then allow people to kind of find their own way uh, mm -hmm. as individuals. Hopefully. Yeah, I hope you're right. I mean, I don't like e any of the labels. Um, I've always called myself a libertarian. Then I gave that up and shifted to classical liberal just because I didn't like to, to be Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, because it didn't capture uh, my positions. And also, I want to be willing to change my mind. Like, if you have a really good argument, a pro-life argument, give it to me. I'll listen to it. Right? I'm still pro-choice. But, uh, you know, because I've heard the arguments, and I don't think they're that good for pro-life. But you know, gun control, I've said, yeah, you know what? I hadn't really given that much thought. I was a big freedom guy. Yeah, people should have guns if they want. I, what, what do I care? Well, actually, you know, maybe this is not such a good idea, right? Because of the you know, massive amount of uh, people die, 40,000 40, a year plus of guns. Come on. You know, if this was terrorism, you know, the conservatives would be going crazy. You know, Homeland yeah. Security, we got to basically they would shut down the Constitution. 40,000 people a, a year died of terrorism in America. You know, look what happened after 9-11, just 3,000. You know, we end up with this massive state, the Homeland Security. Yeah. Again, conservatives, you know, we like small government. No, you don't. You right. like massive, huge military, Homeland Security, National Security Agency, CIA, FBI, law and order, prisons, huge walls, immigration. You know, that costs a lot of money. That's big government. Right? Yep, you're right. <laughs> so. Very true. All right, Megan, that was great. Uh, what's your, uh, what, what are you working on next? What's the next big project? Oh my gosh. Well, I have a sub stack like everybody yep. else. Okay. It's, yeah. Uh, Megan Dom, uh, dot .com. Uh, mm -hmm. I do, I write essays. I'm writing essays on there now. There's also, you can, that's where you can go to become part of the listener community for the unspeakable podcast. I also have the unspeakeasy.com, which is the, uh, women's community for, uh, Free Thinking Women. We're going to have an online community launching early next year. We have retreats. Nice. We go places. Um, sanity spa vacation, I think of them <laughs> as. So people can, I like that. people can go there, follow me on Twitter. Uh, you know, You're I guess Megan we'll link Dom. to all that. It's, it's Megan dot, it's Megan underscore Dom. Yeah, somebody okay. took my, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I have a blue check because I had impersonators. <laughs> you did? That's the only reason. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. I don't think I have any impersonators. All right, just well, you for will listeners, now. it's M E G H A N. That spelling of Megan, just so if people want to look you up. Yes. D A U M. Like Megan Markle. Like Megan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> exactly. All right, Megan. Thanks All right. so much. Thank All right. you, Michael. Always a pleasure. Okay.